This is Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with authors and illustrators prominent in American literature for children. The moderator for this series is Dr. Jacqueline N. Schachter, Professor of Children's Literature with Temple University. Today we have a triple header treat when we bring you Eveline Neff, Caldecott Medal winner for Sam Bangs and Moonshine, Lloyd Alexander, Newbery winner for The High King, and Anne Durrell, children's book editor of E.P. Dutton Company, who has served as editor for both Eveline and Lloyd. Most illustrators think their work speaks for them. Today we want to share some slides of artwork done by Miss Ness and invite you to comment afterwards upon techniques you use. First we have Lloyd's book, The Truthful Heart, illustrated by Miss Ness, three illustrations, and then the jacket design for The High King, Lloyd's Newbery Medal winner, is done by Miss Ness. The rest of the books were both written and illustrated by Miss Ness. This is her Caldecott winner, Sandbangs and Moonshine, two shots. And a runner-up for the Caldecott, Tom Tit Tot. Again, several shots. Now, single illustrations for a double discovery, which you will soon see. And we have exactly alike, long, broad, and quick eye, Josephina February, a gift for Sula Sula, Pavo and the Princess, and Mr. Miyaka. Can you tell us anything about techniques you used? Well, I counted 11 books there. <laughs> and I would say there are probably 11 techniques, uh, because each new book that I get, I do like to change just to keep myself interested. And the techniques run from drawing with pen and ink, to woodcuts, to uh, straight oil painting. That's particularly when it's a full color instead of a color overlay book. And even the last book was a monotype. Tell us about monotype. Monotype is a technique of painting on with oil or something of a, a medium that doesn't dry too quickly. And painting a full picture and rubbing it off, putting a absorbent paper over the painting and rubbing it off so that even though you might repeat the painting, each uh, print would be different because it is only one at a time. We don't have the Caldecott Medal, unfortunately, that Miss Ness won, but we do have a, the Newbery Medal that Lloyd Alexander received. And those of you who have never seen a close-up shot of the Newbery Medal are now rewarded. This Lloyd Alexander received for the High King. Lloyd, you might want to tell us something about the Welsh fantasy tale that brought you the Newbery Medal. Particularly, I have a question. Do children have difficulty pronouncing the Welsh names of your characters? Um, well, not, not half as much trouble as the grown-ups do. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, seriously, as it turns out, and, and Anne will bear me out, I'll never forget the, I suppose it was the day I sent the manuscript of, of the Book of Three in, into Anne. She, she called up shortly after and said, oh, it's all very nice and all such as that, but you know, there's names. Uh, what are you going to do about them? So I thought, well, to you now, no, I didn't make them up. You know, these are the authentic, uh, well, a couple thousand years old, really, the, the genuine uh, names from ancient uh, mythology. And so we talked, and I said, well, to you know, we can't call the characters uh, Charlie, Dick, and Fred. It's not going to be in, in keeping with the tone of the book. And we agreed we couldn't do that. But Anne warned me on that day. She said, you know, you're, you're going to have an awful lot of trouble with them. And I didn't believe her because I was so used to them at that point that to me these were the most common names that, uh, uh, well, you know, what's so unusual about them? Uh, but Anne predicted exactly what would happen. She was right. My sins came home to roost finally, and the, uh, the names are not easy. They're, they're not as hard as they look, but the funny thing is, and, and the kids want to know about this too, how do you pronounce them often? I've noticed that the kids are more likely to take a chance uh, they will see the name, and they're not going to worry too much about a scholarly pronunciation. You know, they'll sort of take a quick grab, and most of the time, actually, they'll be right. Uh, in other words, it's not a problem, really. Uh, all right, we read, for example, a Russian novelist, 
and I'm quite sure that I don't pronounce the names uh, correctly. I hear them in my mind. I recognize them. I can, you know, I make do with them. Uh, and I don't think really that it's, it's all that difficult. Uh, as far as pronunciation goes, as, as, again, as I tell the kids, whatever is easiest uh, and most natural. Uh, but as I say, this, uh, this does indeed come up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Where the double letters appear, as in your protagonist in The Truthful Harp, how would you handle it? Same as single letters. I see. <laughs> see, that's, see, that's I so see. easy. I see. Well, that's a good clue. Um, I think many of my students would like to know what is the role of the editor, since you've assisted both Eveline Ness and Lloyd Alexander. Tell us what your role is, Anderell. Well, I suppose I warn Lloyd not to put funny <laughs> names in his books. That's what it really comes down to. I, um, I call myself a midwife. <laughs> and um, they do all the conceiving, and they have the labor pains. Yes. And <laughs> all I can do is stand by and say, I'm there if you need me. Um, and I think it's easiest probably with a specific example. And since I have both Lloyd and Eve here today, uh, maybe I'll talk about um, a book called His White Pig that um, Lloyd ha that came about in this way. Once upon a time, Lloyd had finished a couple of the Prydain books, and Eve had done the, the long ones, and Eve had done the jackets. And it occurred to me that it would be marvelous to get them together to do a picture book. And so I wrote to Lloyd and asked if he had any picture book ideas, and he sent in three. And we, all the people in my department and I looked at them, and the one we really liked was the story of Cole and his white pig. And so then I wrote a very long letter telling Lloyd all about writing a picture book. For some reason, I was so full of myself. I was just reading the correspondence as if I needed to. It was like telling your grandmother to suck egg, really, because he's such a naturally good writer. And then he wrote the story, and I sent it to Eve. And I can't remember. Uh, in the you never write letters. Mm -hmm. You just say uh, yes or no or okay, <laughs> Eve. Um, so there's no record in there of, oh. of your accepting the job. Can you remember how you felt when you read the manuscript? Liked it immediately. I think that there was no hesitation. I think I let you know as soon as I read the manuscript. And you really liked it? Yes. I like his writing. Thank you. You're <laughs> I like yours too. Thank you. <laughs> and so then, um, I said, well, I think you should, to Eve, I think you, she'd been doing pre-separated art before, and I said, I think you should use the same technique that you used for the jackets. And do you want to know what happened with that? It was your first full-color book. Yes, I've been working so long, having been a painter at one time, but doing children's books, I'd gotten used to doing the color overlay, which posed a lot of problems, but I'd overcome the problems and got delighted in, in experimenting with the overlays that when I was at last given all these riches of full color, I went to pieces. I couldn't, I didn't know what to do with full color, and I literally kept thinking full color. And the first sketches were absolutely ghastly, because I did have them all colored. That's I had right. no unity in the book until I realized that even though I was allowed all full color for printing, that I could still uh, boil it down to one or particular color scheme, which at last got me going. And then I was delighted doing it. You did in the book. I remember you <coughs> had them all pinned up on the wall of your studio to give yourself that, you finally... The sequence of colors to keep them together. Right. Yes. You had them, because I came over to see you, I remember, one day, and, and, uh, and you had them like that. And so then um, Eve said she would do the book, and so um, the designer designed the type, and she did the illustrations, and we put it together, and then Lloyd saw it. And can you remember your... Uh, yeah, I saw it with great glee and delight. Uh, of course, I, I, was, I was kept in the dark about all these uh, goings on. I didn't see it until the press sheet. There's a very good reason for that. Um, uh, the editor generally tries to stand between the illustrator and the uh, author no, if, they don't happen to, yeah. if they don't happen to be the same person. Because, as I think Lloyd will agree, although he's the easiest author, well, I suppose he's had such wonderful illustrators that he's really never had a problem. But even so, the author gets this picture in his or her mind of what he or she thinks the illustrations are going to look like. And there's, if they are involved at all, what they really want to do is stand over the artist yeah. and say, well, I don't think I'd draw it that way. I think I'd, um, 
I don't picture that girl as looking like that, or I don't think I'd do that scene, I would do this scene. And of course, after about three tries at that, um, the artist would just throw up the job in despair. So the editor has to act as um, a neutral state between two hostile powers. <laughs> well, not, not necessarily, because we're, we're all on the same side. Not all! <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> yes, we all want a beautiful book and, yeah. and an effective, expressive book in the end. Everybody does want that. And the artist really wants the author to be pleased. But it's the in-between stages when it does get a little hairy sometimes, I think. What other role does the editor play? Um, well, generally, let me see. I'm responsible for all the children's books that my company publishes. And that means I have to be kind of ahead of a little publishing house within a publishing house. I have a staff working for me, an art director, um, who's also a designer. Um, an assistant editor, and then someone who's the production manager, who's sort of the go-between. And we just have to make sure that all the books get out and that they look the way they should. And it's my responsibility to decide, first of all, which books we publish, and then secondly, to work with the author on them and um, try to help the author make the book as good as he can possibly make it. But it has to be the way the author sees it, not the way the editor. I can't stress that enough, because um, you can't look at the book and think it should be something else and try to make the author do it that way. You have to try to figure out what it was in his mind. And this happens with Lloyd and me very often, and with Eve, too. Um, but especially with Lloyd, when I'll say, um, um, I think you should strengthen this character. And he'll say, but he is strong. And then all of a sudden he realized that yeah. that's what, that was what was in your mind. And you thought you'd put it down on paper. That's right. This, this is the great thing, Anne, because you, you see things that, uh, that I think exist, but I haven't actually done them. And you can see them objectively, which, of course, I can't do. Right. It's, it's easier for you to, to say, look, idiot, this is what you're trying to say. <laughs> I thought I had said it. <laughs> Which I, th I think is one of the, of the key things. Yes, uh, Edward Fenton, an author, said to me once that if he could afford the time to put his manuscripts away for five years and yeah. then come back to them, he wouldn't need me. Mm. But he doesn't have that time, no author does, and they, they must have a sympathetic yet objective eye uh, come to the manuscript. Of course, Anne, I, I would disagree with Edward Fenton because I don't think even five years would would do it for you? <laughs> no, uh, no, seriously, and, and not really, because no matter what the time span would be, you are still immersed in your own head, in your own work. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it's, true. It's a different kind of thing. It's, it's, it's another party somehow. You yeah. Could, you could put it away for X number of years and still not see things that... Those mistakes would, right. those mistakes would still right. be there. That's right. matter of fact, they'd even be reinforced because you get used to them. <laughs> that's so. right, like the names, like that's funny names, exactly. <laughs> Eve, what do you feel when you, um, this, this, when Lloyd said about still being on the same pattern, um, I know you complain when you write a story sometimes and then you start the illustrations. Yes, it's very difficult um, and I have never been able to figure out why. It's just that we were talking earlier about it and perhaps someone made a suggestion which got uh, closest to it was that perhaps after I worked so hard on the writing of it that it's rather finished and it's a completely different thing from reading someone else's story freshly and being involved in the characters. I don't know what it is. It's murder. Because you, you haven't really thought of the pictures as you're writing. I yes. think not. The, the first book I wrote though um, happened to be about, uh, was written, it was Josephine of February, which was written after I had made some large woodcuts when I'd been to Haiti. So actually, I, had, I think I had about six, and I wrote the story around the pictures. Oh. And that was kind of a good feeling. I thought the book's half finished, you know. Right. Except I did have to redo them before the book, instead of just taking the actual large ones. But I've never done it since, and um, maybe I should to break this. Um, I don't think you ever will, pets. though, because you said in this last manuscript that's what you were going to do. Didn't. And then you sat down. She's just finished a story um, called Ek Yek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
but it's really a super story. It's going to be a delightful picture book. Under the circumstances, I'll probably never illustrate it now. No, we'll find another <laughs> illustrator. Her husband always says, why don't you find a good <laughs> illustrator for these stories? <laughs> there is oh absolutely <laughs> no relationship between her reluctance and her success, because sandbanks and moonshine is... Tough. It doesn't show, no. <laughs> no, the books are absolutely beautiful. No, we, no, we all cried privately. <laughs> no, let on. Do you have a question, Carolyn Field? <clears throat> well, I was uh, wondering, may, I, maybe both Lloyd and uh, Eve could uh, answer the question, and that is, um, why do you write? Why don't you do something else? You both suffer, I can see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why do you write children's books? I know, Lloyd, you wrote adult books to begin uh, yes, with, and that's makes, much which, easier. Which now. makes it even worse. Nothing to writing adult books. Uh, I don't know why a person would become a writer with anybody with any good sense. I don't know. I'm probably too lazy to do anything else, too dumb to do anything else. <laughs> don't, no, I don't know, Carolyn. I don't know what that terrible compulsion is. Uh, and I'm, I'm convinced in, in a very serious way that there is some, there is some warp in the, in the personality or whatever it might be, really, that, that allows you to hang on and keep on trying. Well, I'm thinking of my own case. Uh, how many years was it? Uh, seven years that I worked and never sold a thing. Uh, now, who would keep on doing that except uh, some kind of nut? I mean, really. <laughs> and you worked I'd, at such crazy hours. What hours did you uh, often write? Oh, I still do. I, I get up at 4 a.m., that is, and work for a while, then go to work. Well, as I said, I'd rather be tired on company time than on my own time. Uh, I don't know, for, for a person to go through this kind of misery, I don't know about that. that uh, I, I really don't know the, the motivation. And I think maybe in a way, and it doesn't answer the, the question too much, that it's, that it's almost worse not to write uh, than to write. In other words, there's a driving force that's, that's inside right. of you. That's now, right. Eve, was a, she, she was famous as an illustrator and an artist, yeah. and yet I, you're starting to write in your... I still consider myself an illustrator. I, I can't, without sounding falsely modest, I don't consider myself a writer because I only write stories within a certain category, which is for picture books. And I kind of know what it entails in 32 pages to write. And so uh, that's because I've always admired writers. <laughs> and it, made, it was the nicest thing in the world to see written and illustrated by Eveline Ness. And, uh, but I do know that I'm a much better artist than I am a writer. Well, I think there's some people disagree with you on that because your your picture. I don't think it's easy to write picture books. No, it's the hardest. I form. think that's the. It's almost a poetic form. Mm -hmm. Well, I just know the one form. I just, that's all I know. So I, I didn't know it was hard. It's just. Uh, oh, well, don't <laughs> <laughs> I like the I like the limitation of knowing I only write uh, typewrite two pages, double double spaced, and I know it has to be finished then. <laughs> Which makes you a wonderful picture book writer, too, because as an editor, I can tell you that the, one of the greatest faults with most would-be picture book writers is that they write too much. They think they have to put in everything. And of course, what the artist really likes is the manuscript that leaves a lot to the artist, that doesn't spell everything out. We were just talking about a manuscript he was just doing by an uh, author called Lucille Clifton. And she says, the father works at a plant. And Eve said, oh, bless Lucille, she's just left it plant, so I can have it anything I want. It doesn't have to be um, a, manu a car factory or something mm -hmm. like that. You have on some unusual jewelry. Tell us about it. Oh, this is, I had to wear this jewelry because um, when Lloyd first started doing books uh, for me, uh, well, the very first time he wrote a book, it was called um, Time Cat. And, and he gave me an onk. And then um, he did um, the Book of Three, and he gave me something uh, which is a, it's really a, it's from a museum, and it's the head of a yes, sea nymph, it's, isn't it, it's Arethusa? An, yes, Arethusa, it's an ancient Greek coin. But he wanted it to be Ilanwe, so that's what we call it. And then he sort of branched out, and he got yeah. Eve to, um, he found a, a silversmith here in Philadelphia who could do very creative things, and so he got Eve to design this pin, and the silversmith made it. And then Lloyd got interested in etching. 
Is that etching or engraving or what that's, is that called? What do you call that? Or you make a plate? Taglia. It's a. It's actually it's a photo engraving, really. It's a photo engraving. Yeah. Anyway, Lloyd got very, I'm a wonderful editor. I leave all that to the production <laughs> manager. I don't know what the funny words are. I just <laughs> it's all magic as far as I'm concerned, printing. I just think it's so wonderful when it turns into a book. Um, anyway, um, he had this made, and it says, Friends of the Companions. And then this was a symbol that you stole from Eve from one of her illustrations, wasn't it? Uh, yes, that uh, was from Carl and his white pig. That's an, yeah, that, that's an amazing yeah. story. Tell what those mean. Because again, this was something that was in Eve's mind that she didn't even know was there. Oh, and God, Lloyd fell here's, upon uh, that picture yeah. with joy because of uh, this special meaning. Uh, here, here it is, if you remember that, Anne. Right. I mean, Eve, if you remember that. No, I do. How, how you accidentally stumbled on this. You know, this, I don't know, Eve uh, invented the symbol. And yet it's a tremendous thing. It's, it, it's very magical looking. And, and the more you analyze it, you can see all kinds of things in it. Uh, if you look at it in its, in its components, you can see the, uh, the female symbol. You can see the, the male Mars symbol, the Venus and Mars symbol. Uh, here's an arrow ahead. I think uh, some part of it is a, is a runic symbol for death. Uh, the circle is a, is a life symbol. Uh, and almost uh, intuitively, Eve has put together these powerful signs. You know, I looked at that, wow, you know, this is really great. And so that's exactly where it came from. Lloyd, many of my students are interested where you got the curious character of Gurgi. Did I pronounce it correctly? Oh, yes, you did. Indeed, you did. Uh, some, some of you know that story, but I'll, so I'll make it short so, so you won't have to suffer through it. Well, to make a, a long story very short, I got stuck in the, in the beginning of, of the Book of Three uh, for a character who was supposed to come into a given scene, I guess about the third chapter or so, and I could not possibly imagine who or what it was going to be. I had a name for him. I called him Gurgi, but I couldn't see him. And above all, I couldn't hear him. I couldn't hear the sound of his voice. And the book stopped, a dead stop in the middle of the page. Now, this is going to be the world's shortest novel, two and a half <laughs> chapters. Uh, and, and I would get up cracking my skull every day and sit at my work table, nothing, zero. And I was beginning to feel, you know, as if the hardening of the brain was setting in. I could uh, see myself a uh, wonderful career as nipped in the bud and taken off to the Drexel Hill <laughs> poor farm. And, and I was uh, feeling very sorry for myself and uh, uh, sighing and crying and uh, so forth. And at a certain point, one morning, I was sitting there, I heard a funny voice in the back of my mind say, crunchings and munchings, <laughs> a very whining, self-pitying, uh, wretched voice. And I know exactly where that character <laughs> came from. <laughs> but from that moment, the whole thing just, just opened up. I could hear him. I could see him all of a sudden. Uh, and as I say, I know where he came from. There's, uh, uh, we have definite uh, intimate uh, connections. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions from the floor? Rosemary Weber, do you? I've always been interested in your time cat in, in that first book of yours, and I wonder if you're thinking about doing any more books about cats, or whether the tiger, or shall we say the, the leopard, the giant cat in oh, the Leon, series has yes, taken his place. Of course, I, I That's a very leading question. She wants to know if you're doing any more books about cats. Oh, uh, now, Rosemary, let's really get down and we'll talk about this seriously. Now, how, how can I do that without spoiling surprises or... Uh, you, well, yes, I am, Rosemary. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, this is very delicate because I don't want to give away the, the whole surprise. And it's not coming out until next fall. Oh. See, and, so. and this... Uh, now, what, what dare we say, Anne, except uh, there will be something well, yeah, yeah, it's about a cat, person. and yet it isn't about a that's cat. Right. Good clue. Good clue. <laughs> yeah, very good. That, that's a perfect answer. And you have to buy yeah. the book in order to find out what we're this, talking about. This is what I was... I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to come out and say it. <laughs> you know, This is what an editor true. does, by the way. I've just shown you another side of my job. I not only help the books come to fruition, I also am responsible for selling them. So... <laughs> this is... Uh, Easier we, in this case, huh? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. 
Uh, you can see that our guests today have a deep friendship based upon mutual respect. Respect stems from the fact that Miss Ness not only won the Caldecott Medal in 1967, but in the three six preceding years, books that she illustrated were runners-up for the Caldecott Medal, or honors books. Similarly, Lloyd Alexander has many awards to his credit. Not only did he win the Newbery Medal, but he also produced an honor book and has American Library Association notable book awards and the 1971 National Book Award for the marvelous misadventures of Sebastian, which we can't leave unmentioned. <laughs> and Durrell seldom takes the limelight herself but offers encouragement and help to persons like Eveline Ness and Lloyd Alexander. Thank you very, very much for being our